Hi, everyone. Good morning. This morning, I want to share with you some thoughts about holy listening. We just heard read a portion of John's gospel that tells the story of Jesus describing himself as the good shepherd, who through a total self offering of self is profoundly devoted to the care and protection of, of his flock, namely us, his disciples. Also in this reading, Jesus talks about how he must go out and find other sheep to add to his flock saying, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Later in a portion of the Good Shepherd story not included in today's reading, Jesus says again, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I'm sure we all agree that listening to Jesus in whatever form that takes is important. But his voice is just one of many voices in our day-to-day -day lives competing for our attention. And those other voices can easily drown his out. One of my favorite buttons on the TV remote is the mute button, especially when commercials begin to roll. I get weary, as I'm sure many of you do, listening to the voices of automobile dealers and mortgage sellers screaming at me to buy one of their cars or take out one of their loans. I find commercials from the gambling industry and from accident attorneys to be particularly obnoxious. And so the instant peacefulness created by the mutant button is a great source of relief for me. For me, those are some of the voices in the world I know I have no interest in listening to. But these trivial examples really raise a larger question. What are the voices in society around us that we do choose to listen to, either consciously or subconsciously? What voices do we allow to be authoritative in our lives? and thereby influence not only how we shop, but how we think and how we act or what we're gonna believe in about ourselves or others. Over time, the voices we allow into our lives for good or for ill, gradually shape our view of everything, our priorities, our values, and in these days, what is or is not a fact is increasingly driven by the voices we choose to listen to. How many hundreds of times have we heard the words fake news? When we thought of news, we used to, we generally equated that with facts, but um, not so much now. You and I make real and consequential, consequential listening choices every day. We only have to think about the vast number of TV and radio channels we can choose for both entertainment and news, or the number of social media and print platforms and websites we can check out and participate in to know how true that is. Some of those voices encourage hatred and bigotry and seek to divide and polarize, as I think we're clearly aware of. Others seek to unite and promote healthier social interaction. Voices from the advertising world often encourage a kind of hyper consumerism that leads and can or at least can lead to wasted money, wasted natural resources, and unnecessary debt. Some voices come from very narrow points of views, others from a more broad-minded perspective. Some voices want us to think we're not okay the way we are, but that we need to look more beautiful or younger or wear more stylish clothes or drive a particular car in order to be more accepted or admired by others. 
an unreflective or low information person will find him or herself taken in by the loudest and most seductive voice in the room, sometimes to his or her peril. Father Thomas Keating, a Roman Catholic monastic priest, was a leading voice in reinvigorating the practice of centering prayer among Christians around the world. And many of us as Episcopalians are familiar with him. And he died just a few years ago at a monastery in Snowmass, Colorado. In his teachings, Father Keating speaks of the false self, the false self, and the importance of con confronting that false self so that we can discover our truest and best selves. The false self, he says, is our excessive desire for security, esteem, and power. These desires find their roots in the earliest days of our childhoods when physically and emotionally all of us were in fact pretty powerless and vulnerable to being hurt by the people and events around us some of us more so than others, but all of us to some event, to, excuse me, to some extent. An excessive need for security, esteem, and power was not, however, the way of Jesus Christ. In fact, as we know, quite the opposite was true. The story of Jesus being tempted by the devil for 40 days shortly after his baptism, baptism is in the end, really a story about Jesus rejecting what the secular world seeks to convince us as being what security, esteem, and power are supposed to look like. The witness of Jesus' life, along with the witness of the saints, was not to put one's, excuse me, was to put one's ultimate trust in God's unfailing and unconditional love, it was in God, were our real and lasting source of security, esteem, and power lie, laid. One sense of one sense of secure, excuse me, one sense of security came from knowing that death would not have the last word. If God's love could conquer even death, as it did in Jesus' resurrection. Why would we seriously worry about anything short of being as, as faithful a disciple of Jesus as possible? True security is knowing in our heart of hearts that God is good, God is love, and God has our back every moment. It is in knowing that God's love wins in the end, and therefore that we can trust that no matter what, happens to us, all will indeed be well. That's security. Jesus showed us and the saints showed us it is God's love for us. Even when we know we live very imperfect lives, it gives our lives real esteem not the superficial and often fleeting values of this world. And for Jesus and his followers, real power is not to be found in political or military ways, but in serving others with a caring, sacrificial, and healing love. It is, in, it is the emptying of oneself for the sake of another where true power is expressed, because that is what brings out the best in another person and the best in ourselves. I remember when Mother Teresa visited Denver back in the 90s and President Clinton was present to welcome her at the airport. Talk about power. Here was this small, frail woman who had the ability to prompt even the President of the United States to fly all the way to Colorado to meet her. And her power derived purely from her lifetime of self-emptying love for the poorest of the poor dying in the streets of Calcutta, India. It was amazing, amazing. I think it's an 
It is in choosing to approach our lives in this way, the way of Jesus and of the saints, that Father Keating, Father Thomas Keating would say that we begin to discover our true selves, our truest humanity, and our best selves as children of the living God. The voice of Jesus has a distinctive quality to it. It is often, perhaps even normally, very quiet. It's always respectful and never pushy or manipulative. For many of us, his voice comes to us most often in the form of a hunch, a sometimes called a holy hunch. That is, that is the right, that is the right decision that we, we have a sense of what the right decision is or what the right path is to follow. And then later, when we've chosen to follow that decision, that hunch, the good results that have come from that prove that it was in fact Jesus speaking to us. We may not have heard words or seen writing in the sky, but we can look back and say, yeah, his hand was in that decision. And fortunately, I was willing to listen to that holy hunch. No matter how we're able to hear Jesus speaking to us, his is always a voice of calm, a voice of compassion, a voice of forgiveness, of encouragement, of hope, and of healing. His is a voice always seeking wholeness in relationships, always one of expressing unconditional love for you and for me. The voice of Jesus is one that always encourages a generous spirit toward our fellow human beings. It seeks long-term health for our souls. In the end, the voice of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ is a voice that desires to lead us to the highest, the most satisfying experience of what it means to be a human being. All of us, in different ways, have sensed Jesus speaking to us at various points in our lives. We probably wouldn't be worshiping together this morning like this if we hadn't. We have sensed answers to our prayers. We have come to understand better what our life callings are, the an awareness of what God was pointing us, that God was indeed pointing us in a certain vocational direction. Perhaps the spouse we pursued and married was the result of sensing from God that he or she was the one. <laughs> Yet for each of us, there's always room to become even better listeners, to become even more open to what Jesus may be saying to our minds and hearts at any given moment. It's kind of like fine tuning a radio <laughs> dial so as to get the strongest and clearest signal. So to that end, you and I keep showing up for these Sunday morning Zoom worship times. And in so doing, we give Jesus yet another chance to speak to us through the scripture readings, through the prayers, oftentimes through the hymns, and even through one another during our Zoom coffee hours. And when possible during these COVID days, he speaks through, of course, the blessed bread and wine of communion. At home, we set aside time for prayer. We read our Bibles. We sit silent in silent meditation, all for the purpose of becoming even more tuned in to and attentive to the voice of Jesus, giving us life, giving direction, resilience, and hope. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want, says the psalmist. How true that is, if we will but listen attentively to what our good shepherd has to say to us. Amen. Amen.